Our uh, opening keynoter today is Julie Pagano. Julie is passionate about diversity in, t in the tech community. She works with Girl Develop It in Pittsburgh, uh, PA, which I think is Pennsylvania. She helps organize Steel City Ruby Conference and also organizes online support groups for techies who need help pu with public speaking or dealing with imposter syndrome. Somehow, she also manages to find time to work her day job as a software engineer focusing on front-end development and user experience. Welcome everyone, Julie. Or maybe, I'm not a good programmer. And you hear these things. 
things, and you may think that they are modesty. And for some people, yes, they are. But for people with imposter syndrome, this is not modesty. This is honesty. They actually believe what they're saying. And the thing that they often think to themselves, but don't say out loud, I'm a fraud. And this is really the core of imposter syndrome. It's where the name comes from. Not only do they feel poorly about themselves, but they think they're a fake, and they're terrified of the people around them finding them out. And that can be really stressful. Now, you may be saying to yourself, but Julie, everybody gets insecure sometimes. What's the big deal here? So I want to clarify, everybody has kind of those ups and downs throughout their career, especially when you get a new job, you're brand new, you feel like you don't know anything, you can have kind of those ups, but you usually level out and you manage. For people with imposter syndrome, they also have these ups and downs, but they're a lot more frequent, they're a lot more heightened, and they tend to have a lot more negative consequences. One of those negative consequences is that people with imposter syndrome tend to hold themselves back in all sorts of ways. People with imposter syndrome often don't share knowledge. They don't speak at conferences. They don't write blog posts. They don't even share with their coworkers or their teammates because they devalue the knowledge that they have or they're afraid of sharing it and saying something wrong and having people find out what a fraud they are. They also don't collaborate for a lot of the same reasons. Think of an example like pair programming. Imagine if you're afraid of people seeing what you think is your bad work and pair programming. Somebody's literally sitting next to you all day watching you write code. That's terrifying if you have imposter syndrome. And it can actually kind of have this negative effect where you're so anxious about seeing somebody see you fail that you fail because you're not focusing on the problem and instead you're focusing on your anxiety. So as a result, some people just try to avoid this entirely, and so they're not helping others, they're not learning as much because they're so afraid of being found out. And people with imposter syndrome often don't help with open source because they don't think they're good enough to be involved, or they're very afraid of the open nature of it and how public it can be. Unfortunately, we've all probably seen one of those issues or comments on a thread where somebody asks a question, submits a pull request, uh, asks about a feature, and people respond piling on, telling them how stupid they are, or how this isn't good enough, or how terrible they are. And people with imposter syndrome see that too, and they're very afraid of becoming that person. And that can actually hold some of them back from contributing. And that can be really bad because that means we're missing out on all these people who could be helping with open source. Lastly, people with imposter syndrome often don't apply for jobs. I've seen this one in a bunch of my friends where they were stuck in a dead-end job, where they weren't being paid enough, or they weren't learning anymore, or they were just very unhappy, and they weren't looking for a new job, despite the fact that there's hundreds of companies looking for more software engineers, because they didn't think they were good enough. And so they would stay at this dead-end job getting more and more unhappy. And this one hits really close to home for me. So I'm currently a software engineer at the Google office in Pittsburgh, and I've been there for about a year and a half. And I've wanted to work at Google since I was in college for computer engineering. I never applied for an internship. When I graduated, I never applied for a job there. Didn't send them a resume, didn't talk to a recruiter. Despite having good grades, work experience, I didn't think I was good enough to work there, so I didn't try. And I got a job somewhere else that I thought was more in line with my skills, and I stayed there for about five years, which was about three years too long, because I didn't think I was good enough to try anywhere else. So a recruiter from Mountain View contacted me when I was like at the end of my rope with that job, and she spent a half hour on the phone with me, talking me down from my imposter syndrome, telling me that I should apply for the job, that really they wanted me, that it was okay. And I didn't want to work in Mountain View, I wanted to stay in Pittsburgh, so she had to contact me with a recruiter in Pittsburgh, and then she had to have the exact same conversation with me a month later, uh, talking me down from it. And from there, I studied, I worked really hard, and I got a job there through my own skills. Thank you for the woo. <laughs> uh, but if that recruiter had never taken the time to really be willing to talk to me about my insecurity with it, I might not have even interviewed. I might never have worked at Google. And if somebody had had that conversation with me earlier, if I had learned, known about imposter syndrome earlier, maybe I would have been working at Google for much longer. It's hard to say. But this is some of the things that can happen. One of the people I interviewed said, you shouldn't feel like you have to slay a dragon to get a job. And I hope you enjoy this picture of my cat. Um, <laughs> 
And this is the thing. Interviewing for jobs, I think, is very nerve-wracking for everybody. But for people with imposter syndrome, it tends to reach heights of mythical proportions for them. Another person I interviewed described imposter syndrome like this. You start small, like everybody starts small, we all do. But you remain small because of all the ways that you hold yourself back. And you end up small because of that, meaning you never reach your potential. You never provide that potential to the communities you're a part of, all because of imposter syndrome. Now you may be saying to yourselves, but Julie, Maybe these people just suck at programming, and they know that they suck. <laughs> I want to clarify, those are not the people I'm talking about. So most people have a good balance between understanding, OK, this is my actual ability, and this is what I think it is. Those people are not the ones I'm talking about. People with imposter syndrome live kind of over here. They actually have decent ability, but the perception of their ability is quite low. And so it's a mismatch between those two things. Interestingly, there's another group of people who also have a mismatch like this. They suffer from something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which unskilled individuals suffer from illusory superiority, mistakenly rating their ability much higher than average. And they live up here. <laughs> now what's interesting is that both of these groups absolutely exist in our communities, particularly in open source, I think. And you should think about the impact of these two groups in your communities. The Dunning-Kruger folks, they think that they are awesome. They're, they think they're great. They submit to speak at conferences, they write blog posts, they can't wait to contribute to your open source project because they think they are hot shit. And they're so excited about themselves. The downside is the perception of their ability is much higher than it actually is. And so they often don't realize when they make mistakes they often don't know the limitations of their skills, and so they often don't ask for help when they should. They don't know when they're just like flying off into this weird direction, because their skill set, they don't know where their limitations are. On the flip side, the folks with imposter syndrome are actually fairly skilled, but they don't think they are. So they don't promote themselves. They don't submit to speak at conferences. They don't write the blog posts. They're going to be really hesitant about contributing to your open source project. But the thing is, they're pretty skilled. They know where their limitations are. They're very careful about the work they do because they want it to be really great and they're so worried about screwing up. And they know when they need to ask for help. They know where the limitations of their skills are. I'm not sure what the right answer to all this is, but I think you should think about this when you're trying to build your communities and how are these people fitting into it. So I talked about people who hold themselves back. On the flip side, people with imposter syndrome push themselves too hard. A lot of them perceive themselves to be behind their peers because of this devaluation of their skill sets. And as a result, a lot of them try to play catch up. They start taking on more projects. They want to do more things, learn more languages, contribute to everything, because suddenly they'll catch up. And suddenly they're doing all the things. <laughs> all the things. And let me tell you, doing all the things is not sustainable for any period of time. It's really terrible. And when you try, it leads to something called burnout. And burnout is long-term exhaustion and diminished interest in work. And when you get to burnout, you no longer love coding. In fact, you kind of hate it at this point. And that can be game over for people. And that's really bad. It's one of the reasons I'm talking to you today. This is avoidable. If we help people, if we give them tools to help themselves, burnout is really scary. I know this one personally. About a year and a half ago, I hit burnout really, really bad. After spending a year of doing all the things. Let me tell you how that is way too long to do all the things. A year. And thankfully for me, I had a really good support system, and I would say my burnout lasted about a month. And that's actually not too terrible. I know people where burnout lasted them six months, a year, five years, permanent. Those are really scary end games that we want to avoid. And that's part of the reason I'm talking to you today. I really want us to be able to help people so that this never happens. And now that I've depressed you horribly, I'm going to talk about the tools we can use to fix this. The burnout doesn't have to happen. We can help ourselves, we can help each other. And as a result, it's dangerous to go alone. I'm going to provide you some tools to help with this. Now, disclaimer, I'm going to give you a bunch of things that worked for me and the people I interviewed. Not all of these may work for everyone, but I think it's worth giving some of them a try and seeing what works for you, your personality, your needs. Now to start, this one I think is critical for nearly everyone, and this is build a party. And what I mean by that is build a support system of people who you can trust that are going to support you and also be a good feedback system for you. 
As somebody with imposter syndrome, your self-evaluation mechanism is kind of broken. And so you really want a support system of people who can give you honest, constructive feedback. These aren't just yes people who are going to be like, yeah, you're awesome. Yeah, you're great all the time because you won't believe them. You want people who are going to tell you when you do well and also tell you when you screw up and, how you, and help you fix it. They're not going to be mean, but they're going to be constructive. These can be friends that work in software engineering. They could be coworkers that you trust. They could be people you went to school with. They could be friends from your open source project, people from your IRC room, whatever works for you. Mine are kind of like a little bit of all those things. And these people are really great also for when you have those bad days, which I think we all have, but especially for people with imposter syndrome, you have those days where you're really down on yourself. And it's helpful to have friends who can look at you and very seriously say, Julie, I think that's the imposter syndrome talking. I think you need to like calm down. It'll be okay. It's really helpful to have that. So another thing that's really good is tracking measurable progress. I know that as software engineers, a lot of us really like data. And this will allow you to work with data to help fix this problem. You can make a program to help you track your data if that makes you really happy. I know we love yak shaving, and so that'll be really fun. But this is really great because it's a bit more objective. The problem with imposter syndrome, again, is that we don't evaluate ourselves very well. So subjectively, if you ask me, am I a good software engineer? I might say no. I may be like, I suck. Uh, but if you set practical, measurable goals for yourself and actually track them, then you can have some objective data to look at to answer that question. It's much harder to argue with the numbers. So for example, last year, one of my goals was, I want to become a public speaker. And I'm going to speak, my goal was, I will speak at one conference, because I was just getting started. And I spoke at three last year. So if somebody asks me, are you a good public speaker, and I have to answer subjectively, I might say no. But I can look at the data and I can say, well, I spoke at three conferences last year, and that was my first year speaking. That's pretty good. So this can help you work through that and start to find some positive things about yourself. And that takes me to look for positives. Again, I talked earlier about how creating that equilibrium between positives and negatives. People with imposter syndrome, really great at finding the negatives. We don't need help with that. But the positives are a little harder. So one of the ways you can find them is tracking those goals, like I said previously. Another one is actually forcing yourself to look for positives. Maybe you start out once a month. Once a month, you're going to force yourself to write down something positive that you've done as a software engineer, a designer, a PM, whatever your role may be. And then you're going to move to doing it once a week, and then once a day. And you eventually create a habit where you are actually training yourself to look for positives to try to even out those negatives. And this is something that many people do naturally on their own. But for people with imposter syndrome, you kind of have to retrain your brain to be willing to do this. Now, for those of you without imposter syndrome, you can help. You can help others find positives. A lot of us are really good in this community at telling people when they screw up or getting annoyed when they make a mistake, really good at helping them point out the negatives. Again, the folks with imposter syndrome don't really need help with that. They're already beating themselves up sufficiently. So you can also help with positives. If somebody does something nice for you, if somebody helps you fix a project, if somebody writes some really great code, actually tell them that. You could be helping them find a positive that evens out a negative for them that day. It seems small, but it really does help. So on the flip side, you should work on avoiding negatives as well. We all know that person. They exist in almost every community. The hostile genius that people keep around because they're good at coding, but they're really nasty to everyone. They're always looking for ways to tear down the people around them. It's never constructive. It's just, you suck. And those people can be like kryptonite to people with imposter syndrome. They're really harmful to them. So if you have imposter syndrome, try to identify those people. If you can't avoid them, realistically, you often can't. So the other thing you can do is identify them as a bad source of data about you. They are not a valid resource. You have all these other people you can talk to. You have a party. You have hopefully good coworkers or a good manager or a good person running your open source project. And if you, get, if you can't completely block them out and they say, you did a really shit job at this, you can go talk to your party and say, can you guys give me an honest feedback about this? Did I do OK? Please tell me if I did screw up so I can work on it. Like You can have a constructive conversation with them. You can't have a constructive conversation with that person. So try to think about that. And for those of you, everybody really in the room, imposter syndrome or not, you should avoid creating negative spaces for others. And a lot of these things are a little more subtle. 
Hacker School has a really good list of four things to avoid in their user manual, so I just kind of have cribbed them for this because I don't need to reproduce it. So one of them is no feigning surprise. Oh my god, I can't believe you don't know this really obvious thing that everybody knows. Let's face it, in the wide world of programming and computing, there's millions of things you could know. No one person knows everything. When you make them feel bad about not knowing something, you're not producing anything valuable, and you are making somebody feel really terrible. Instead, maybe you could talk to them, let me help you learn how to do that. That might be better. Another one is, no well actuallys. And this is basically pedantry. Uh, I, exp I had a question for this one from somebody who is a non-native English speaker. Just to clarify, well actuallying is usually kind of a pedantic argument that isn't really useful to the conversation. If somebody says they want to do something for the project and it's totally wrong, it's okay to tell them that. Like, that's okay. That's not well actuallying. That's being productive. But well actuallying is like just derailing the conversation into bike shedding because you have to prove how right you are. Don't do that. Another one is no backseat driving. This is just as annoying when you do it with computers as it is when you do it in a car. Just don't. <laughs> and lastly, and I hope this one goes without saying, but it's on their list and it's valuable, no subtle sexism, racism, homophobia, etc. This one is kind of malicious and I don't think it really fits with the first three, but don't do that either. So I think it's important to think about these things, especially the first three, because we all do them. If you do these things, it doesn't make you a bad person. I'm really bad at the well actuallying. I'm really trying to break myself of the habit. But these are things that provide no value, except maybe to make you feel good about yourself. But they, break, they, they make everybody else feel bad. So I really want you to work on not doing these as much. Even just doing it a little bit less really helps and creates an environment where people with imposter syndrome can thrive better. Instead of feeling like they're not welcome or constantly feeling negative, this can really help them. And suddenly they're able to contribute to your community more and all you have to do is just not stroke your ego a little bit and they'll feel more comfortable. Another thing you can do as somebody with imposter syndrome is help others. This was a really big one for me. I run the Girl Develop It chapter in Pittsburgh. It's an organization that helps teach women how to code and I teach classes, and I'm also the organizer. And when I started doing this, it helped incredibly with my imposter syndrome because I suddenly saw value for myself. I had students who were so excited that I was helping them, that looked up to me, and suddenly I realized I have value. Even if not to everything, to these students, I am really helping them, and that helped me find a lot of positives about myself. It also let me see what imposter syndrome looks like from the other side. I had students in my beginner classes who were doing a really great job. It was their first time ever programming. And they were doing an amazing job, and they would look up to me and very seriously say, I'm stupid, I don't get this, I'm doing a terrible job, I can't do programming, and all these things like that. And it broke my heart to hear that. Because it wasn't true, they were doing a great job. I was blown away by how well they were doing as beginners. And I realized, this is what I sound like to other people when I put myself down. And I don't want to break other people's hearts by doing that. So I started to really be a little more thoughtful about it. On the flip side, I had to be really careful about not doing that in front of my students. Because my students were looking up to me, and if I put myself down in front of them, that, that's in some sense an insult to them as well. If I think I'm stupid, what do I think of my students? So I had to be very careful about that because the last thing I wanted to do was make my students feel bad. So as a result of having to be much more thoughtful about how I speak about myself, I, I'm less negative at my, uh, to myself because I have to be more thoughtful about it. So this can be really good for people with imposter syndrome. Now my slightly controversial piece of advice is kill your heroes. Not literally, please don't chase any of the speakers around with a sword later. It violates the code of conduct, and I will be very cross with you. <laughs> so, what do I actually mean by this? What I mean by this is that in a lot of software communities, I see it in almost all of them, we start to hold up certain people as celebrities, heroes, like these godlike creatures that were birthed fully formed with a laptop, writing amazing code. And we imagine that that's where they are, and that they never make mistakes, they never create bugs. They're like, they're like the Chuck Norrises of the programming community. And there's actually jokes like that about one of the guys who works at Google. It's ridiculous. 
But so when we do that, it can actually be really harmful to people with imposter syndrome because they start to compare themselves to those people. And when they imagine that they were, they never worked to get to where they are, that they just magically came out that way, it makes it hard for them to see how they could ever be that awesome because it's not something they work towards, it's just magic. It can also be really hard for them to compare themselves when they think those people don't make mistakes and they know they make mistakes. So they think, I can just never be that cool. And it can be really hard. So what I recommend, kill the hero, leave behind the human being that is actually there. The reality is that our heroes write bad code. They break things. They introduce bugs. I know that they do. I know some of the people who are the heroes in the Ruby community from when I was involved there. I've seen Steve Klabnik write bad code. I've seen it. <laughs> and, and they're just regular people. And they all started small like the rest of us did. There was no magic. They were not birthed with a laptop. That's not how biology works. <laughs> and, and so they really did work to where they got to, work to get to where they are. So that if you look at it that way, it can help you see, oh, I could be like them or I could work towards being awesome. And it's okay if I make mistakes. And it's okay if I'm not magically there now because they're just human beings like I am. It's also important to realize that you don't always want to be those people. Their idea of success and value doesn't have to be yours. And that's really important to look to as well. So I have my own personal example of this about somebody named Aaron Patterson from the Ruby community. He's also known as Tender Love. And he's totally one of those heroes in that community. Like people know the name of his cat, Gorby Puff. There are Rubyists who have stickers of this guy's cat on their laptops. It's ridiculous. <laughs> So I have stickers of my cats now, so I can compete if you want some later. Uh, <laughs> so he's really, really well known in the Ruby community, both for his public speaking and for his coding. Like he's, a very, he's very well respected for both those reasons and legitimately so. When I was starting to want to get into speaking a few years ago, I was really questioning whether it was possible because I was terrified terrified of public speaking. And I thought that that anxiety meant that maybe I just wasn't allowed to do it because I couldn't compare to these heroes like, him, like Aaron Patterson, who are amazing public speakers. And it looked like they had just been naturally doing it forever. And then I saw him speak at Steel City Ruby two years ago. And before he went on to talk, he said, I get insanely nervous when I give presentations. This guy talks all the time. He gives really great talks. He went on to give an amazing talk about open source after this. But he said he gets insanely nervous when he gives, gives presentations. And in that moment, it killed the hero for me and left behind a human being. And I realized he gets insanely nervous. He's one of the best speakers I've seen. That doesn't, so being nervous doesn't mean I can't be a speaker. I won't be as good as him when I start, but I can start and try. So the last piece of advice, which I got from every single person that I interviewed for this talk was fake it till you make it. Now I wanna be really clear, do not use this for your technical skills. <laughs> Putting stuff that you don't know on your resume and so badly, don't do that. But this is great for things like confidence, for pushing yourself to do something you're unsure you can do, but you pretend you can because you need to push yourself. For example, this is totally what I did when I started public speaking. I was terrified, but I said, I'm gonna do it because I have to, I can. And I pushed myself and eventually I accomplished it and I knew I could. Same, it's really great for applying for a new job, pushing yourself to do something you're a little bit afraid of, pushing yourself to decide you can do this. Another person said, the secret to life is pretending you know what you're doing. It's another picture of my cat. <laughs> And I think this is really true for a lot of this. If you only ever do the things that you know you can do as somebody with imposter syndrome, you will stay small. You have to push yourself a little bit. You don't have to push yourself so much that you lose your mind, but little steps is really great. So I really wanna encourage you all to talk about this. I think one of the biggest problems with imposter syndrome is that we quietly whisper about it, and so people often don't learn about it. They feel like it's something they have to be shamed about. Talking about it can really help. If you think you might have imposter syndrome, please try some of the tools I've suggested. Help yourself know that, that this can get better. And if you don't have imposter syndrome, please help others. Just because it's not directly impacting you doesn't mean it isn't important. Even if you wanna do it for selfish reasons, when you help these people, you're gonna get more people involved in your communities contributing better and you're gonna get something out of that. And please enjoy coding. I love it and I want you to as well. 
Now, since I'm doing the opening keynote, I'm gonna force you, or at least ask you, to try to consider some of these things throughout the conference. One of the things I would love for you all to do is set some goals for yourself throughout the conference. And these are some suggestions, you don't have to do these. One of them is meet at least N new people, where N is greater than zero. <laughs> For me, I have a pretty high number for this because as a speaker, I know I'm gonna chat with a lot of people. Set a number that's comfortable for you. I would recommend at least four, one each day, maybe a little higher, depends what your comfort level is. Participate in one of the activities. There's a whole bunch of activities going on throughout the conference. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff happening in the Hacker Lounge. There's some workshops. There's open spaces on Friday? Friday? Okay. Yeah, so there's lots of activities. Pick at least one that interests you and actually actively participate. Don't be a passive observer of the conference, actually be a part of it. Consider talking to one of the speakers. I promise we don't fight. That would also violate the code of conduct. Uh, <laughs> and part of the reason we're here is to chat with you, to be friendly with you. Uh, I, at least I think so, that's one of my goals as a speaker. So consider talking to us if you have something you're interested in chatting about. And ask questions, and that could be of speakers, of other people you meet at the conference. I know it's cliche, but there's no stupid questions. Unless you ask a rude question, don't be rude. But ask interesting questions, learn from people, it's really cool. So hopefully you can set you some goals for yourself and meet them by the end of the conference. And I'd like to also ask you to consider two goals that I don't think are optional. And one is help others enjoy the event. Really try to think about some of the things I talked about throughout this event. Try to make this a fun time for everybody. And on that note, avoid creating negative spaces. And I'm just gonna remind you again one more time about the hacker school rules. No feigning surprise, no well actuallys, no backseat driving. These three I'd really love you to at least diminish. I know that can be hard, but keep them in mind. And the last one you just shouldn't do. Uh, no subtle sexism, racism, homophobia, etc. That last one violates the code of conduct, and I made a few jokes about that, but the code of conduct is actually really important. Please keep that in mind throughout the conference. It's really important to help people enjoy themselves and have a good time. So ultimately, please enjoy OS Bridge, and I have links here really quick. I also have an online support group to talk about imposter syndrome for people who are interested in continuing this conversation. We have an IRC room. And we also have a Google group. I think we already have a few people in the audience who are part of this. It's a really nice group, um, so you're welcome to join. That group also has a code of conduct. Please review it and let me know that you've read it when you try to join. I won't let you join if you haven't read it. And I also have the slides up on speaker deck if you're interested in looking at them. And thank you.